So for us to connect to any machine on the internet, we need its IP address. Right? So even when in our browser, we type www.google.com, what our browser needs is the IP address to which we would establish the TCP connection. Right? Now, this entire process is the DNS resolution process. So obviously, on the back end side of Google, we would have a bunch of front end servers who are responsible of serving google.com. These are the servers in which their code on Angular or whatever framework they are using is, is there. Right? And these servers are the ones which are capable of serving the home page of Google. Obviously, these backend servers are behind a load balancer. Right? Now, assume that this is a very simple architecture. Obviously, Google has it much more complex than this. But assume that the IP address of this machine, this load balancer is 17.53.21.253, which means this is the machine to which or this is the IP address to which your browser will establish the connection when someone types in google.com. Right? Now, how does your browser know that when someone reaches out to google.com, it needs to connect or it needs to connect to this particular IP address. Now, somewhere this particular mapping needs to be stored. That www.google.com means 17.53.21.253. This is typically the A record or the C name record in the DNS configuration at Google. Now, this configuration is done in something called as a DNS zone. Now, this zone is specific to Google.com in which the mappings are stored. www.google.com in 17.53.21.253, bar.google.com is some load balancer C name or some MX record, TXT records and whatnot. These are all stored as part of your zone configuration. So if you're using AWS, you would know in Route 53, what you configure is a hosted zone. This is that hosted zone. This is a logical grouping of the domains and the uh, logical grouping of all the subdomains and the DNS record for a particular domain. So everything about google.com is in there. Right? So you might have multiple such zones for different domains that you own. Right? So now, given that is a logical entity, this mapping needs to be served from some server. Now these servers are called authoritative name servers. Now these servers responsibility is pretty simple that given a request for a zone that they own, they need to respond the record against it. So for example, I have this pink zone is the google.com zone. Whenever I, and they say these three name servers are responsible for serving it. So when a request for google.com comes into one of these three name servers, it because it owns the zone, it would go read the key value pair, get the value, send it back. Right? That's what it would do. So authoritative name servers are the ones on which zones are hosted and given a request, they would send a response for the corresponding value. This way, if someone reaches out to these name servers directly asking that, hey, what is like, I want to connect to www.google.com. Where should I go? Because it owns the zone, Google www.google.com, it can get this IP address and serve it. But now somehow the request needs to reach to these. Now, what are these authoritative name servers? These name servers typically look like this, ns1.gns.com or awsdns.net or something like this. Now, these are the name servers that we typically configure when we purchase a domain. Let's say you purchase a domain on Namecheap or GoDaddy or wherever, the default name servers that are configured, there are of GoDaddy's name servers or, or uh, Namecheap's name server or AWS name server. Those are the name servers on which the zones are hosted. Right? Now, we need, like you can obviously change these name servers. For example, you can buy a domain from GoDaddy, but you can choose to use AWS's name server so that you can manage your DNS through Route 53. You can very well do that. Right? Now, we know, we reach to the point that if we somehow know the name server's name, the authoritative name server's name, given a request, it would give me the record that I was looking for. But how does your browser know this? Your browser cannot possibly know for all possible domain that exist. So there are two ways to do it. Obviously, first one is let there be a single gigantic system which contains all possible domains, all possible subdomains against which you are storing all the mapping. Obviously, millions and billions of entries, single system, not scalable, not fault tolerant because if this goes down, the entire internet is down, not even manageable, the amount of reads that are coming in, the amount of writes that are happening on this the sheer volume of data it needs to handle. That's why 
centralized system for this would not work given just the sheer amount of request it would need to handle and the amount of data it would need to handle so which is where the world has gone with the approach of decentralization where one machine does not know it all so what does it look like now that we know that we have to somehow reach to this authoritative name server this ns1.gns.com now what does the process look like you cannot have a single place which knows all the details so it needs to be a decentralized system so this is where a critical component comes in called dns resolver now dns resolver is the one that does the dns resolution process whatever the process is we'll go into the specifics of it but whatever the process is it is done by dns resolver now where is this dns resolver running dns resolver can run at multiple places one popular place is at your isp level let's say you are connected you are using as uh, you are you are using act internet act is your isp when the request goes to the act backbone the server that is handling it would be doing the resolution for you okay. your browser typically does not do that your os typically does not do that you can make your os do it by the way you can write your own dns resolver it's not a big thing right but to simplify it your isp can do it for you so request anyway will go through the isp your isp is doing the resolution for you and responding you with the ip address so that you can establish the tcp connection with the backend of google right otherwise if you are on your home internet even your router is capable of doing it so your request you let's say you are on a wi-fi network you are connected to a router that router can do the dns resolution for you so i took a screenshot from my machine if i if i'm on my windows and i fire ip config slash all i get an entry called dns servers which contains the ip address of the machine that is my dns server which is my dns resolver and it is 192.168.0.1 that is the ip address of my router so in my case my router is doing the dns resolution for me so obviously the request from my machine is going to the router the router is doing the dns resolution and caching obviously the dns uh, the domain name ips and whatnot because it does not need to do it again and again so in my case router is doing it but you can change this to a popular dns resolvers like google dns resolver called 8.8.8.8 .8 or cloudflare dns resolver 1.1.1.1 and then these are just dns resolvers the request goes to the dns resolver the dns resolver if it has the ip address against the domain name it sends it back if not it does the entire resolution process caches the ip address and sends the response to the user this is what happens at the dns resolver level so i would highly recommend run this command on your terminal and see what you get in the output that is your dns resolver try changing it to one of these and see what happens right okay now how does the dns resolution process look like so now that assume that there is no caching across any layer so what does a very crude process look like so say if you are looking for www.google.com which means on our browser we type www.google.com your browser needs to somehow reach or establish a tcp connection with that machine 17.53 machine right now request from your browser went to the router assume that your router is doing the resolution part for you so what will router do router will talk to something called as a root name server what is this root name server in the world there are total exactly 13 root name servers they start with they have the name like a.rootservers.net b.rootservers.net till m.rootservers.net each root server or root name server is owned by a company or a institution let's say first root server a.rootservers.net is owned by verisign b.rootservers.net is owned by university of southern california right now here 13 root name servers exist in the world does not mean there are 13 physical servers it means that there are 13 fixed ip addresses which are my root name servers ip address whoever wants to get its domain name result can talk to that and it would spend out the other details uh, as part of protocol but then if these are obviously these would have been just 13 physical machines just imagine the sheer load those 13 machines would be getting so obviously this needs to be even distributed now how does that work here the key thing is that although it is one fixed address for each root name server owned by a particular organization that does not mean there is exactly one physical server for that root name server there are many 
all of them are distributed across the world and they all advertise the same IP address using Anycast. So, for example, a dot root name server has some IP address, like that's a fixed IP address, fixed IP address for a dot root name server. And let's say there are 50 servers across the world. They're all broadcasting the same IP, IP1, 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 whatever that IP address is. They're all broadcasting the same IP address. Now they are broadcasting with any cast. The beauty of this is that whenever any machine, let's say my machine is trying to resolve uh, www.google.com, it will go to one of these 13 root name servers IP. These are all hard coded. This literally hard coded 13 IP address. It would reach out to one of them at random. Now, whenever it reaches out to them, what would happen is it would reach out to the nearest physical server broadcasting the same IP or advertising the same IP. Now, what happens? It goes to the nearest one and that would return the response that a root name server is supposed to return. That's the beauty of this. Right. So again, I'm iterating. These are 13 root name servers, which means 13 fixed IP addresses. It does not mean there are 13 physical servers. So for each IP addresses, for each IP address or for each root name server, there are multiple hundreds of servers distributed across the world, across the world they are distributed. And now whenever your router is trying to connect or trying to resolve and connect to a root name server, it would connect to one of those machines. Which machine? The nearest to one. How? Using Anycast. Now, if Anycast is a separate beast in itself, I've already explained Anycast in one of my videos. I would highly recommend you to watch that. The video on my channel is how Google uses Anycast to make their load balancers highly available. It's a very old paper on how Google made their load balancers highly available using Anycast. Highly recommend you to watch it to know the intrinsic details of how things work behind the lines. Right. Okay. Now, assume that your request went to the closest root name server here. What would that server do? That server responds with the IP address of another server, which is supposed to handle the top level domain .com. Because we are looking for google.com, it would return me the IP address of a TLD server, a top level domain server which is responsible for handling .com. Similarly, for every top level domain, there are set of servers which handle them. So a set of servers for .com, set of servers for .in, set of servers for .edu and so on and so forth. Okay. Now what happens is root name server is aware of these, the, the TLD servers, the TLD name servers, it is aware of that so that it can respond. So that's the responsibility of root name servers. Now you'd say, but Arpit, Every time anyone is accessing website, does all the requests go to the root name servers? Not really. Here your browser is caching a lot of stuff. Your operating system is caching it, right? The root name servers have fixed IP addresses. And even if let's say I get a TLD name server for or IP address for .com TLD, I, my machines can cache it because how often would that change? Not frequently. Right? So there is a lot of caching involved over here so that the request can directly go to a .com server and then it goes to the authoritative name server and whatnot. Right? That's how it works. Now, what does the entire process look like? The process looks very simple. Let's say this is your router or your ISP who is doing the DNS resolution for you. It first talks to root name server. Root name server spits out the IP address of the machine which owns .tld, uh, sorry, .com .tld. So it goes to that machine. It responds with the authoritative name server that is configured, which is ns1.gns.com, which internally goes to the authoritative, which owns that zone, which is a google.com zone. And because the next request goes to that, it can see for www.google.com, who owns, uh, what is our value against it? 17.53.21.253. And that's where it responds. Then your browser, then your uh, DNS resolver gets it. It spits out this to your browser. Your browser then establishes the connection to this IP address, which is your load balancer. Then load balancer forwards the request to one of the backend servers or the frontend servers and responds with the HTML. And that's how your request, your connection is established. Then the request goes, HTTP request goes and the response is sent. And This is one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of software's written. It made internet what it is possible today because it gave a human readable name to every single thing out there, not requiring us to remember weird IP addresses of machines. 
right? And that's the beauty. This is how the entire DNS resolution process works. So just to summarize, assume that nothing is cached, request comes to a DNS resolver, let's say your router goes to root time server, root time server responds with the IP address of a server handling .com TLD, request goes to that, it responds with the IP address of authoritative name server that owns the zone google.com because you're looking for www.google.com. So against google.com, what is there? It goes to that name server because it contains a corresponding zone. It is, it can respond what is against www.google.com, which is this IP address. So at every step you are going, get me top like .com TLD. You go to .com, give me w, give me google.com stuff. You go to that name server and say, give me www.google.com. So it's step by step, step by step resolution that has happened over here, right? And this is how you eventually get the IP address that you can connect to establish the TCP connection. And then you send the request, get the response. And this is how the entire DNS resolution process looks like. So I'm kind of going down the rabbit hole of exploring the DNS in depth. So my next set of upcoming videos will be about me trying to building my own DNS server. So stay tuned on my channel. There is a lot of interesting stuff that is coming along. So yeah, this is all what I wanted to cover today. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Adam.